according to their own understanding, uh, to first to the to the those who were uh, landless, then to those who were land poor, and then you know up to middle peasants who had smaller holdings if they needed, uh, and and thereby they distributed according to them they have distributed about 300,000 acres uh, in this in the area where they were. Um, Having, while they were going through this experience of 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 land, I mean of uh, land expropriation and land distribution, they they also realized that it will not be enough to just distribute land. That they had to do something much more because they discovered also that there was very little irrigation. Uh, uh, potential. Uh, there was very little of irrigation provided in that area. Um, only about two percent of the entire tribal area had any irrigation uh, uh, available to it. Uh, this was then where, where they decided that it was it would be very important in order to ensure that the peasants actually gain out of land distribution and people's economy. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, improves that it is. It, it would be. It would be necessary for them to think in terms of whole lot of things, like thinking in terms of what kind of irrigation facilities that they could provide. Uh, they, uh, according to the survey, this, this, they discovered that a lot of uh, there, there was a lot of potential for water harvesting in this area. They encouraged peasants to form cooperatives or collectives and work as work teams in these areas. Uh, while all this was happening parallelly, they, I mean, when they were, when they, when they introduced their, their, their uh, land reform in, in this area, they also ensured, I mean, this was, an, they, they deliberately and consciously took a position in favor of and much against the Adivasi um, uh, tribal society's norms, they, they, they ensured that where land was given, it was not just given to a male member of the family, but even the female members of the family got entitled to, 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 uh, to, uh, to possess land. Um, uh, women whose positions, I mean, one would imagine that in an Adivasi society, the relationship between man and woman is far more egalitarian than in other non-tribal societies. But it, they, it's nevertheless true that uh, the patriarchy and discrimination still exist in our tribal societies. And many of the tribal um, uh, practices, I mean, for instance, women were never allowed to participate in discussions. I mean, if there was village meeting going on, and if men were participating in, in discussions, women were al always expected to keep silent unless they got the permission of the male members to speak up. The party's intervention ensured that this practice ended. Many other things that they, they, they intervened in, I mean, the social practices. One of the things which became also very controversial with anthropologists because uh, 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 because uh, they, they, they uh, when the party decided to, to uh, intervene in what is known as the voter system in Bastar amongst the tribals where men and women, young men and women, um, uh, there is, this is an annual feature. Uh, concert. I mean, they, 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 they the young people get together, <clears throat> and this is some kind of a um, 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 maybe a practice for matchmaking or whatever. But it had degenerated, and where the male members used to exploit young Adivasi women, so they decided that the, the, this hotel system must undergo a change. So for it took them about six years of relentless debates and persuasion before they could manage to get the Adivasis to agree to change this practice and where this, uh, the, the, the hotel system which used to result in uh, men sleeping with any Adivasi woman of their choice and women could not say no to, this practice they managed to stop. They were of course criticized by many anthropologists and many others who, who claim that the, Ma the Maoists are necessarily interfering with the, with the uh, Adivasi uh, uh, interfering in Adivasi society and its practices and its rituals and that this is something that they ought not to have done. Nevertheless, I mean, the manner in which they went about doing it was interesting because instead of imposing a diktat, 
they introduced, I mean, they, they, through a process of debate, discussion, and persuasion, they managed to bring about this change. Now, the reason I'm, I'm giving you just uh, snippets of this information is primarily, first, to demystify something, I mean, uh, something which, uh, when you hear the word Maoist, it comes immediately to your mind, which is um, a, a group of people, armed band, who go around uh, mindlessly killing and engaging in mindless violence. Uh, the reason I'm therefore starting with this uh, on this note was primarily to show you that they've been engaged in these 30 years. They've been engaged in every facet of life of the Adivasis. They lived like them. They learned their language. They did not just learn the language, they actually preserved the language. And so much so that today when they, they, they are thinking in terms of introducing <coughs> a special script Rogoni language which never existed. So their contribution has been at every level and they have been engaged with people. I mean, and today when if you go to the area, it would be very difficult for you to, I mean, Adivasis, Maoists are not non-Adivasis. Maoists are Adivasis. They are the tribals who have become Maoists over the last 30 years. <coughs> that is one thing that one has to realize. Second thing one realizes is that the people who who the, 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 the Maoist cadres who came from Andhra Pradesh or from Bihar or from West Bengal or elsewhere, in the last 30 years of living there, they've actually declassed themselves simultaneously. They've become also, I mean, it's very difficult to, dis, you know, to distinguish them from the local population in terms of their lifestyle, the way they speak, the, the clothes they wear, uh, the food they eat, etc., uh, etc. Et I mean, there is no there is it's very difficult for anybody to make any you know to to say that this person is from outside and this person is a tribal because it's very difficult to, unless they speak up and they themselves declare where they were originally from uh, now the Maoists when they entered this area or whichever area they enter this is how they work this is precisely how they work if they were, if they move into a peasant area, also, I mean, they, their lifestyles change. They adopt the lifestyles of the people, uh, uh, which makes which makes it possible for fee people to feel that these are actually one of us, that they are not outsiders who come to harm us. And not only that, that these people have actually adopted our own lifestyles and they are willing to live like us, which gives brings. The, the, the party and the re party's relationship with the people is of a very different order. It's not a, like a political party which stands for election, which um, uh, which has a pa pa you know party unit there, uh, which uh, which uh, you know uh, propagates its views and things like that. And at time of elections, goes and canvasses for votes and then goes back and disappears from that area. This is this is this is unlike any other political party in that sense because they are there amongst them. They are no different from them, and it's not as if they depart after their work is done. They remain. That is one thing I wanted to say. The second thing I want to point out is that the Maoists believe that the only way in which, in their understanding, India is uh, is a country where it will not be possible for any revolutionary transformation to take place, but by people being up. Right or wrong is a different thing, but this is their understanding. Now, why do they believe it? Their understanding is that in the, if you look at the record of Indian history and the communist movement or the left movement in the country, then you will discover that each time the left has tried to work and create a mass movement of, uh, or you know mass struggles over various issues. It has always met with opposition and then, you know, the state repression starts, the crackdown takes place, and that movement is crushed. Again and again, I mean, the history of Indian people's struggle is again and again, they emerge, mass movements emerge, I mean, people work hard, mass mobilization takes place, mass struggles take place, and they also get crushed. And each time you have to pick up the threads again and start all over again. And this they have seen. And they have seen also, they believe, 
in their understanding that each time they've tried to work peacefully, they've tried to work non-violently, tried to work to, mob to, to uh, mobilize people, uh, they have also been thwarted and their own experience also testifies to that. So therefore, and Indian state is not, a, I mean, it's not like any other state. I mean, it's, it has a history of 250 years of British Raj, what we inherited. There was only a transfer of power. There was no restructuring that took place in India in 1947. The state which the Brits had created remained intact and it was taken over and handed over to the Indian ruling classes. And the same institutions and, and set of laws and set of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the practices more or less remained intact. So, I mean, it was just a change in, 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 in the transfer of power from one, from one hand to the other, from the Brits to a set of Indians. And right from 1947 to 2011, the history of India is that there is not a single year, there is not a single year where the Indian state has not gone to war against its own people. In fact, the unique history of India is in since 1947 that it has it has the unique uh, uh, history where uh, uh, <clears throat> where from, from I mean it is supposed to, uh, to to be a, a parliamentary democracy but where despite 15 parliaments and people ostensibly what <coughs> voting voluntarily and selecting the representatives who, uh, for, for the parliament despite 15 parliamentary elections as the Pankar's data showed the people have remained ex oppressed and exploited now unless we believe that people have voted these people into power to ensure that they remain oppressed and exploited, the only explanation is that the system cannot address, or system does not want to address the issues or the demands and the aspirations of the people in whose name they get elected and then they come to power. This makes it very difficult for any communist, I mean, the, for, for uh, the, the, the Mao's belief, for any communist to think in terms of, to envisage a possibility of a peaceful transformation of power and a peaceful transformation of the state and society in India. Because any time they want to do it, it would be crushed, given the, 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 the might of the Indian state, the military strength of the Indian state, it would be used by the ruling classes to crush it. So unless people are... Now, there are many other things that one can add to it that after 1857, when the Brits for the first time managed success, succeeded in disarming the Indian peasantry. I mean, all earlier empires, they tried it, it was only the Brits who succeeded in disarming the Indian people. And it's 18, from 1857 onwards, the state has therefore become very Weberian in the sense that it had reserved for itself the right to monopoly over means of violence. And it does not allow anybody else. And despite that fact, I mean, if you look at reality, you discover that in India, while there are 40 million private guns in India, now it's it's for us to decide whether these 40 million guns, which are available to the to the private citizens or are in private hands, are they with the ordinary people or they are with the upper class, upper caste of the Indian society. Given this nature of violence, which is in it, given this nature of military strength which they have, and the institutions and the laws that are operating, it would, it would, it would seem very difficult to imagine that any ruling class, uh, and especially in the Indian ruling class, would peacefully allow 